Can everybody hear Jeff? Yes. Because you've already heard Jeff once already today, haven't you? Welcome to the Flourish Revolution, and we've called it a revolution because we do think it's something that is actually quite revolutionary, and it's something that we need. And you know what they say, all it takes for something bad to succeed is for good people to do nothing. We're good people and we're doing something and we want you to join us. So the Flourish Revolution is designed to help you get rid of some of those re really worrying statistics that you hear about in workplace surveys. The fact that 70% of staff are disengaged. Managers tend to actually alienate staff and drive them away. The fact that it costs you £30,000 to replace a member of staff, and that's an average member of staff, not somebody who's really senior. So we're looking at getting past that. We want you to have a really positive workplace culture. Jeff's already told you we're not allowed to say happy, so we're just saying positive. <laughs> and because we feel it's such an important thing, and in a transformation of workplaces as we know them today, and it is a revolution, and we do things a little bit radically, because we have to in order to create a revolution. I want to bring in more people to hear us. So we're going to do a little warm-up. It's like a street theater type thing. OK, because you wanted a bit more, didn't you? Hands on something. At <laughs> <laughs> personal request, at the back there, we're just going to, not too much, don't get too worried, we're just going to start clapping. And if we move into a little bit of roaring, and a little bit of so everyone is going to come in from around the uh, area, from around the area, to actually engage with us. So off we so start clapping. <laughs> so if we're thinking about creating positive workplace cultures, we've got to be replacing something. So what is it that you can think of about your current workplace or previous workplaces that have been less than positive? What do we got? High turnover. High turnover. Inexperienced managers. <laughs> That's been a hot topic of discussion this morning, I'll have you know. <laughs> managers. Lack of a plan. Lack of a plan? Yeah. It sees how recurring it is, all these negative aspects, all these things. 
There is a rhyme and a reason, by the way, we're starting with the negatives. Being a positive uh, thinking, positive behaving company, we are starting with the negatives for a reason. Any other negatives within the workplace that are blocking, flourishing, or, yes? Having very high performance expectations and low performance structures. Mm -hmm. You guys have worked in some really tough places, haven't you? <laughs> Mine's all been sweetness and light. No, not really. <laughs> not really. So we kind of, we've spoken to quite a few people and we've got similar advice to that that you've just given us. These are the problems that a lot of organisations need to overcome. And it was after World of Learning last year that Sharon, Jeff and I got together and we started formulating Flourish as a, a concept and I think it took us until probably about April before we finalized what the model was going to be and we actually address every single one of these in Flourish and the way we've done it is we've looked at it from both an individual perspective and from an organizational perspective because to have an, a flourishing organization you've got to have flourishing individuals so it works both ways and it works quite, quite nicely. So just to run you through very quickly, Flourish, as you're probably aware, starts with F. And it ends with H. So we're going to start at the end, because we like to do things differently. The H is for health and physicality. We're not saying we're perfect. We're not going to come in and say you should be on a diet, you should be doing physical exercise every day. It's about making smart choices for yourself physically. Just having a little bit of fun with it. Small changes, that's all we're asking for. For the uh, organizational perspective, we're looking at how does your organization support you being healthy in the workplace? Have you got showers? Are there places to change if you cycle into work and you want to get changed when you get there? Is there somewhere you can go and sit? Is it a nice bright office or working space you've got? All these various different things all contribute either individually or organisationally towards the health and physicality. And I think also what feeds into that, the people were here before and to repeat that again, is the physiology of, of, of the way we do things, the way we walk, the way we hold ourselves. Sitting for too long say, uh, has an actual effect on us emotionally. So we need to be getting up a lot more, getting into the fresh air, circulating for our blood to circulate and for getting more oxygen into the brain beyond the smiling aspects which we talked about earlier. So the physicality aspects, how physiologically we can affect our emotional state, very important to take into account. Latest research is room temperature for ideal working conditions should be 23 to 24 degrees. Any colder and people aren't working optimally, any hotter and they're not working more. So it's interesting, even things like that can affect and have an impact on the way your work is focused and, and developing. So that's really important in terms of age. Yeah. And if you've ever been in a training room when it's been too hot or too warm, you'll know that if you've got delegates that are sitting there and they're not enough, it can sometimes be quite a challenge to keep them with you. So yeah, that's very, very important. The next thing obviously is self-acceptance and growth. We are what we are and we've got to accept that. Whether that's as an organisation and recognising where we are in terms of our future plan or looking at ourselves and thinking, you know what, that's something I either can't do 
don't want to do or don't enjoy, so I'm not going to do it. Accepting that, that's fine. It's not a problem. And similarly, with the organisational aspect of it, look at your organisation. Are they doing and saying what they should be? And are they accepting of that? We've heard lots of uh, examples of organisations that have got wonderful sets of values that are plastered all over walls. And that's as far as they get. They're plastered on walls and nobody lives them. Ever. So it's about that as well. Then we've got influence and choice. What have you got influence over? Can you change the weather, for example? No? We're with the wrong bunch. <laughs> accept what you can change and influence and accept what you can't and don't worry about what you can't change. The more you concentrate on what you can influence, you find that your influence will grow. Similarly with your organisation, how can you get things slightly different? Looking at your physical environment, looking at what it is you can do to help your customers. What's different? What can make that spark? Is it if you're working in a call centre saying to your employees, you know what, forget the script. Imagine it's your mum on the other end of the phone and you're talking to her as a customer. Is the conversation going to be different? Radically. Unless you don't like your mum. Which is possible. And I think if you back to what we were having a conversation earlier, self-awareness feeds into that. It's being being self-aware of where's your, where are your thoughts going? And I often hear people saying it's important that they get a raise. No one's got any idea where they're going to get a raise. And if you're constantly thinking about that whole time, will I get a raise, when will I get a raise, you're missing everything else that's going on around you. You're missing the opportunity to have positive experiences and the way just something you're not in your control. And you recognise that that's not in your control. The serenity prayer, do the people actually know the serenity prayer? Do you know the serenity prayer? Just very quickly, it's, uh, let's say, I, I don't know whether people believe or don't believe in it, and it's irrelevant to this. It just happens to be that the serenity prayer has God in it. But we can take God out of it if we want. But it does say, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Now, who generally repeats that day after day? Addicts. And I sometimes think, I work a lot with drug and uh, alcoholics, I sometimes think we're all a little bit addicted to negative mindsets and behaviours. In order to change that, we need to recognise, be self-aware of what we're addicted to and where our mind's constantly wandering or I'm all focusing and reverse that and start looking for the positives. So it really is working on ourselves to influence first of ourselves before we can influence other people. If we we're giving ourselves negative feedback, what sort of things are we saying to our customers? If we have negative chatter, incessant negative chatter, the customers are hearing that, even though we're thinking we're making positive sales statements, they're hearing our inner chatter, because it's quite loud generally. Our negative stuff is much louder often. Uh, coming out of there, so that's important. Going on to the other end, resilience and mindfulness. How many of you have ever had a bad day at work? How many of you have gone home and thought, you know what, I'm not sure I can do that again. That's really tough, yeah? It can be. Resilience and mindfulness is all about having the tools and the capabilities to be able to cope with that and just take that little bit of time for yourself. Calm yourself down, work it all out, and move on. Stuff happens. As Jeff said in his presentation about um, positive optimism, yeah, it's not all about everything's rosy. It's just a case of figuring out, okay, stuff's happened, I've got to get on with it. And you can. The better you can cope with it, the more you're going to be prepared for both work and life. And that's the same really for your organisation. If your organisation's resilient, if it has a bad day, a bad quarter, a bad year, it can bounce back, it knows what it's doing. So these are all the kind of things that we're trying to build in and we've built into the Flourish model. You, which is unity and relationships, uh, and you talked about here, gaps in communication. To make sure you're on the same page, 
but it's very difficult to be on the same page if everybody's keeping their page close to their heart and not revealing it to the person next to them. And we find this a lot with power struggles or political intrigues in workspaces. That people are guarded, very guarded about their knowledge and not revealing it when in fact it would benefit everybody around to know what the other people are doing, to make sure you're on the same page because you're working for the same organisational goals. Sometimes we forget that. And the idea of developing almost a family, not a dysfunctional family, a fun good functional family within the workplace is really important to reaching the great visions we put out there. We can't reach it if everybody's going off in different directions. We need to be pulling in the same direction, feeling that we're together in this. So when the SHIT is hitting the fan, we need to be there together to be able to cope with that. At the same time is when we need to be looking for where are our successes and building upon that as a team. And we need to be honest and sincere. And the word that's coming up more and more is authentic leadership. Because what that seriously means is, I am going to tell you exactly what I'm feeling and not hedge, hedge it and make you guess. Nobody is telepathic. And afterwards when the manager comes to you and says, I don't like the way you did that, I meant you to do something else. Well, I don't know what he meant me to do because he didn't explain that. And you can't guess what he wanted you to do if he hasn't spelt it out. And sometimes we have to be have those conversations to ask what is me meant here so that we are on the same page. One of the reasons, one of the major reasons people give for leaving their work is negative management, management or negative feedback from their supervisor. It's an amazing amount of people that are interviewed and say, why do you leave your work? Because my manager was very hard on me. And a positive statement from a manager can make all the difference throughout the day and a week. Just one positive statement against all the negative statements that come out. Looking for what works, looking for what you can complement your colleagues with, and not what's not working. And often why we, we look for what's not working is because it makes us look better. If we say what they're doing wrong, oh, it must be that we're doing something right. Even though we're not necessarily doing something right, we're seeing ourselves in terms of the worst. So that's not necessarily improving anything. So that unity and relationship is key. In fact, one of the keys for flourishing organisations, good work chat, work, work, uh, working relationship with your colleagues, to the point that positive psychology research, which a lot of the model is based on the science of happiness, actually says that if you've got one best friend at work, your likelihood of you being happy at work is raised about 25%. One close friend at work. Oh, optimism and positive emotions, which I talked about a, a lot earlier, is it actually working out where the positive emotions are and going for them. Understanding how much negativity we have in our individual lives and how much we're bringing that into our workspace and shifting it and making sure that will also impact on our, on our personal lives. So it's a win-win sort of a, a -win situation. So putting the positive emotions out there, a wonderful book by Professor Barbara Fredrickson called Positivity. Ten positive emotions to identify and to work on on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure they're anchored in your life, personally and professionally, to make sure you have a positive, not only thinking, but positive thinking is almost passe, because they realize it's not enough to be positively thinking. You have to be positively behaving or positively emotional about what you're doing. So you have to have that whole positivity in your life, not just a positive mindset. And that will create the growth that you're needing. So optimism and positive emotions. Yes, introducing the word happiness, but being a bit careful about that. Happiness goes down in America. I always say this, less in the, less in the UK. So they've actually said semantically, you want to bring us in, you say to your, the managers, if you need the managers, you bring them on board, or you need the senior director. Positive workplace culture. Because happiness sounds Californian, okay? But that's what we're talking about. L, which is laughter. How many people laugh? Can I just say around How many people laugh every day at work? <laughs> every day. Oh yeah. Oh, always, yeah. Okay, once a week. Once a week. Yeah. So we've got to laugh and laughter here. We've got to laughter here. Yeah. By the way, we can generate laughter simply by doing it without having any reason for it. There's a whole thing out there by an Indian doctor called laughter yoga, which is actually, in my view, nothing to do with yoga, it's just about laughter. But if you call it yoga, it sounds serious, so we all go yoga. Yeah. It's actually just <laughs> And if you do it long enough, it catches on. 
It's contagious. Positive emotions as are negative emotions. They are totally contagious. If you have one person coming into your office space, nervous and irritable in the morning, by the end of the day, everybody is nervous and irritable. Even though they can't identify the reason why, it's transferred onto the people around. So if you're going to get people stuck with an emotion, get them stuck with positive ones, laugh a lot more. In fact, it's becoming more encouraged to laugh because you realize the effects of laughter, it makes people more lighthearted. It's not taking yourself, it's taking yourself less seriously, it's not taking your work less seriously. It's taking yourself less seriously. I can laugh at myself, I can make more mistakes. If I can make more mistakes, I can learn from those mistakes and take risks. So uh, have a good laugh. In fact, I want you to do one quick exercise, very quickly. Everyone, quick finger up there. Never ever, uh, I'm probably talking about relations with colleagues, never point your finger at anybody, but yourself. Anyway, point your finger at yourself, look at the person next to you, and laugh at yourself. <laughs> 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 now I can decide I have a big stomach and I can decide to go on diet or just laugh at my big stomach. <laughs> because if I'm getting anxious and worried about it, all my energy is going there, I'm not going to be positive about anything else. I'm just thinking about my stomach culture. So we've got to learn a lot more about laughter and finally focus and meaning. How many of you when you get up in the morning think, wow this is fantastic, I'm going to work! It's good that there's a couple of you. <laughs> At least there's a couple of you. Think about that, because you know what is it that you, what is it that flicks your switch? What really floats your boat? What gets you out of bed in the morning and makes you think, I really, really want to do that? We got any people that have got hobbies? Yeah, sports people. Anybody play golf? No. Okay. Hobby here. What's your hobby? I'm good baking. So baking. That's my way of. Um, I like pottering in the kitchen on a Saturday, Sunday morning, and that's my way of calming down, relaxing. So pottering in the kitchen. I play golf, and I spend an awful lot of my energy in getting better at golf because I really enjoy it. Do I spend as much time on getting better at work as I do at spending time getting better at golf? And for me the answer is yes, because I really enjoy what I do. And if you can answer the same to yourself, you know, what do you do, what do you enjoy, and is that as, as much as work, then you're fine. From an organisational perspective, what are they focused on? Have you got a whole series of different things that you're looking at, or are you fairly finely focused? Anybody here good at multitasking? If you put your hand up, I'm about to call you a fibber. <laughs> Because there's nobody good at multitasking. It's a myth. Computers are where we got our fascination with multitasking from because they can do things very, very quickly. But even computers don't actually multitask. They just do things more quickly. So that's kind of the model for you. And what we've got... Sorry, just one more thing, because it's very interesting about the... The, the focus and vision. I often go in, to meetings when I ask the people at the meetings who said, and I take it normally from their, their website, the vision of the company. And I go into a company and I ask the people of the company who said this, who made this statement as a mission, a mission, mission statement for the company. And it's amazing the answers I get. Oh, Facebook said that. Oh, Google said that. And at the end I said, no, none of those companies said that. Your company made that statement. But they said it once upon a time, and they thought it was a good idea, and it was a good idea. But if people aren't aligned to that vision, and aren't working towards that wonderful vision, it's not going to happen. So if we get people aligned to that, I think that's what's really, really important. So all of that has to come together for an organisation to flourish. So what we're going to do is we're just going to give you out these little self-assessment forms. And you can see our little flourish sunflower, and I don't mean that flourish sunflower. <laughs> our little sun flourish sunflower is on here, and it's got a scale on each of the letters. Zero being in the middle, ten at the top. Just mark yourself from zero to ten, and just have an idea, or give yourself an idea, as to where it is you think your organisation might benefit from some improvement. 
Does anybody need a pen? Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'll give you that one. I need some more. Uh, yes, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Oh, You're very welcome. Here you go. Put one here. There you go. Anybody need a pen? Has everybody got an assessment? Assessments. How many of you got tens across the board? <laughs> yeah, that's appropriate laughter. <laughs> it's appropriate. If yeah. everybody had tens, we wouldn't have work to do. Yeah. <laughs> Is anybody willing to share a particular area that your organisation either is or has experienced difficulties in? Imagine that impacts on the organisation as a whole then. Oh, massively. People, people don't know what to do inside like business. They don't know who sits up and leads and who's bad and not. And, and then they're expecting the customers to understand what they're selling when they're not on the same page in two, two separate offices. Sometimes we're in two different things in the organisation. They're not in that clear communication. You don't know who you're talking to or about. Right, and right. And that really impacts, yeah. Absolutely. Big thing, isn't it? Yeah. Big thing, yeah. Um, one area we struggle with is the F of the same. Yeah. We've got in black and white our vision, our mission, our core values and our 12 key competencies. And if I were to ask the majority of my management, not even my junior staff, my management team, what they are, what they need, they wouldn't have a problem. I did an activity with my executive team, they were doing a team building in February. Yeah. We're getting ready to set our objectives and targets for the year. We have 11 words of our start of our mission statement. I put them on the on the table, and it took them over 10 minutes, and they kept getting it wrong. And they couldn't even recite those first 11 words. And when I gave them a choice of 20 words to choose our five core values, we kept getting it wrong. And that's my senior manager. And that's your senior manager. So what do you so expect from me to be at any point? So it, it affects our brand. It affects Wow, and if you think 39% turnover, 750 staff, that's a, that's a, that's a big staff. number, isn't it? At £30,000 each to replace them. And it includes a lot of our senior members. Yeah. So this is one of the ones we really struggle with, and then that impacts everything else. 
It's interesting. I went to a, a Christmas party last year in London for a recruitment company. And I've got to be honest, I went there because I thought I'm going to be able to get some business from this company because they're going to need what I'm going to sell. And I was pleasantly surprised and disappointed to learn that I wasn't going to be able to get any business from them because their MD and CEO lived and breathed all of their company values. And because he lived and breathed them, so did everybody else. And it was fantastic to see how happy they were in their work. As a result of that. Yeah. And unfortunately, his company is probably one of the only ones I've come across in the last five years that I can say that that's true about. Yeah, it is. It's possible. Yes, exactly. Oh, that's it. Realistic optimism. There we go. It is possible. It, it's, it's also the word meaning. So because your values, the values and the vision of your company is what gives meaning to the individual employee. And the more meaning you have in your life, the happier you are. Meaning is almost something that's almost replacing happiness because it gives us something even more concrete. If people have meaning, they can go through the worst situation. As long as they know at the end they're working for something that has beyond them as an individual, working towards a larger vision of the world around them. So that is very important to establish top down. Absolutely, absolutely. We've got your details, haven't we? We've got your details. So finally, as we finish, Jeff is going to ask you to think for a moment about something that you really, really like. In fact, love about your company. So you're going to start with a sentence. You can turn to the person next to you. And you can work and freeze. Freeze is good. And you can turn to the person next to you and say, I love my work. And you're going to say it in that sort of excited tone. And you're going to mean it. <laughs> I love my work. You're going to identify one thing. So we want you to finish on a positive note here. Even though we recognise that all we've got to offer is something so important for your workplace and needs to be learnt, that you need to bring us in as soon as you can. And we'd be love to work with you guys, even if it's in the seashells. We're prepared. Even if it's in the seashells. We're prepared. Especially, not especially, I didn't say especially. I was tempted to, but I didn't. Uh, we'd love to work with you yeah. in the seashells, even in the seashells. And to come in and start working with you and transforming your workplaces. Because if it was that easy, it'd be happening. Because everybody believes what we say. But you actually need to learn the techniques and the strategies to engage and make sure it is happening. So turn around to the person next to you. I love my workplace. I love my workplace because... Okay, I love my workplace. Because... I love my I started teaching people to ski, because I'm a ski instructor, yeah, so that's, yeah. Anybody wants to volunteer? Yeah. yeah. You stand up <laughs> and you say, you stand up with great pride. I say, I love my workplace because, and you make the statement, and the rest of us go, yes. <laughs> okay, this is going to create a yes. Okay. Here we go. Are we ready for a living? Okay. Yeah. I love my workplace. Okay. I love my workplace because I can see the potential. Yes. Anybody else? Here we go. Anybody else? I love that. 
<laughs> that's very good. Uh, I love it. I love the whole, uh, the whole thing. Yeah. But um, so by the end of our workshops, that's what you'll be doing. <laughs> that's what you'll be doing. But it takes t doesn't it take time to be able to let go and do these sort of things? That at the end of the day, we do enjoy. So we enjoy being like hard to we enjoy letting go. But we have to give ourselves permission or allow other people to give us permission to do it. So it's a whole process, recognizing its process. We have a one day which gives you a fantastic insight to what we're doing, but then we have ongoing programs around Flourish, which is part of the Pole Catchers Group. And you're very welcome to come to all the lectures around Pole Catchers Group, all about being more emotionally intelligent, because that's really going to make the competitive edge. When we're talking about creativity and innovation, if you're not balanced emotionally, you're not going to take the risks you need to make a competitive difference in the business world. Thank you very much indeed. It's been lovely having you here. Make sure we've got your details so we don't lose you because we're coming in. We're yes, coming in. we want to come and help you. We're coming to see you. We like your details. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Don't forget to leave your details. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you all sheets of paper. I want you to fill in your details. But the important part is at the bottom. When you say, when are we going to meet? Because otherwise, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen if we're not going to say when we're going to meet. Okay. It's just going to be in the air. And it's such a wonderful idea. If we can't not so this person just said, I'm going to finish it. She's moved in. She's moved in. She's moved in. Oh, okay. Of yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's a company in its own right, but it's a subsidiary of Pearl Catchers. Yeah. So you guys here so, yeah. today? It's a catch that we want to do, as I'm sure you can tell. Yeah, no, I think it's good. Am I alright talking about it? Because I, I like blogs no, I and I write to my clients. Fill in the details and come and collect. I like that. Obviously, I'll say something. Yeah. But I think it's really a good thing. Thank you for being fantastic. Of course, yeah. Like I say, we have got the personal version of this as well, so that you can mark. People can mark themselves on it. And if you want to write about that, we're quite happy to, you know, for people to to write in. We can get one of these for themselves, and we'll send them a little brief about what that means. I'll give you the individual one. Okay. Thank you.